A single drop of water is not very powerful, is it? Now, compare that to the force of a waterfall, a tidal wave, or a flood. These powerful forces of nature are made of the same H2O as a single drop of water, and yet their effects are very different. The concept of dose response is like comparing a drop of water to several drops, to many drops, to the enormous number of individual drops, or something we might call rain, needed to create a waterfall. As with exposure to a single raindrop, exposure to small amounts of a given toxin may have no measurable effect whatsoever, while exposure to larger amounts of that same toxin could have harmful or even lethal effects. In other words, the risk of harm increases with dose. You may think of cyanide as a deadly poison, but this table shows that that's not always the case. Cyanide can be either lethal or cause only light symptoms depending on dose. What do we mean when we say toxin? This term generally refers to harmful compounds or substances made by living organisms. Venom, estrogens and soy products, alpha aminitin and deshead mushrooms, all of these are naturally occurring toxins. The related term, toxicant, usually refers to potentially harmful compounds that are man-made. Toxins or toxicants are substances that interfere with normal biological functions, such as digestion, breathing, development, or reproduction. They also refer to substances that can increase the risk of a disease, like cancer. For the purpose of food toxicology, this could be the amount of peanut or shellfish residue required to cause an allergic reaction, or the intake of cyanide compounds naturally found in peach pits that could interfere with normal oxygen exchange. In fact, almost anything we might encounter in food, vitamins, protein, calories, food additives, packaging materials, and water, can interfere with normal function or increase disease risk. Wait, water is toxic? Yes, very high water intake, more than about a liter per hour, can dilute out the sodium necessary to control heart rhythm. This is called hyponatremia. This means that almost all food-related chemical compounds are potential toxins or toxicants. So, for the rest of the course, Keep in mind that any time I say toxin or toxicant, I am referring to a potentially harmful chemical substance. As we learned in the last video, whether or not harm occurs depends on exposure levels, exposure frequency, and exposure duration. Paracelsus, who is considered to be the founder of toxicology, said, all substances are poisons. There is none that is not a poison. The right dose differentiates the poison from the remedy. In other words, the dose makes the poison. Distinctions are often made between good and bad chemicals, between natural or synthetic chemicals, or between health food and junk food. But the science of toxicology does not make these distinctions. Instead, in various ways, toxicologists try to understand what dose of a substance might cause harm in a given population. To formalize our definition of dose response, Let's say that it is a measurable response for a given exposure to a toxin. Dose response is typically shown as an XY graph where the X axis is the dose of a substance and the Y axis is the response or effect being measured. Notice that the last graph is the LD50. This is the lethal dose for half of the test population. LD50s are often used to make relative comparisons of toxicity. Toxins with lower LD50s are considered to be more lethal than toxins with higher LD50s. How are dose response curves and LD50s determined? Dose response curves for humans are not directly taken from human studies because intentionally exposing humans to toxins would be highly unethical. But these are extrapolated from animal data where high doses are used to produce some measurable effect. There are two general types of dose responses, acute and chronic. Acute doses are one-time exposures over short periods of time, seconds to perhaps a day. Anyone who has gotten chili pepper in their eyes 
or had their nasal passages overwhelmed by the burn of wasabi can attest to the fact that even a single acute exposure can have profound effects. When speaking of acute doses, we are typically focused on the how much part of the exposure equation. Chronic doses are long-term exposures involving days, months, years, or even lifetimes. This means that chronic dose response takes into account all of the components of exposure, how much, how often, and how long. When considering dose response, we must consider the relevance of dose to a given population. In some parts of the world, for example, Bangladesh or the desert southwest of the United States, arsenic is naturally present in soil and leaches into the groundwater. This means that if you live in one of those two areas, arsenic is a concern. If you do not, it is much less of a concern. To state the obvious, toxins only have toxic effects if we are exposed to them. Without exposure or without sufficient exposure, toxins may remain hazards but never become serious risks. Referring back to our water analogy, one drop all by itself does little in comparison to large amounts of water. In contrast, even the dripping of water can erode the hardest of stones if given enough time. Dose response considers the toxicity of each drop or unit of exposure as well as the frequency, meaning how often a drop falls and the duration of exposure which would be related to how long those drops fall. All of these are used to estimate risk.